Okay, uh, well, as uh, Dr. Arsenega said, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, this is the fourth in our six part series on brain injury and behavioral health. I just wanted to point out that you'll receive a follow up email after the webinar with a link uh, to a survey for one hour of CME or participant credit. Once you've completed the survey, you'll see a link to download your certificate. The follow-up email will also list our CME provider's contact information if you have questions about credit. And that information is also listed in today's slides. Our speaker today is Dr. David Arsenegas. I um, wanna let you know that a link to a PDF of Dr. Arsenegas' previous talk from November is in the reminder email that you, you received about today's webinar. There will be time at the end of the webinar for Dr. Arsenegas to answer a few questions. Dr. Arsenegas. Thank you very much. And again, welcome everybody. I hope everyone is having a good start to their new year. Um, our topic today is improving cognitive outcomes after traumatic brain injury. Uh, this has been an area of specific interest of mine for the better part of 25 years. Um, so I hope after all the time that's gone into it, what will emerge is a synthesis and integration of information that I hope you can find applicable in your day-to-day -day work with people who have post-traumatic cognitive impairments. By way of brief housekeeping on the front end here, um, as you know, um, this is a educational opportunity for which CME and CE are available. Uh, the statement from the provider, Medical Education Resources, is here, as is the link to the CME survey site that you'll need to complete in order to get credit. And we're hoping that folks who want it will claim their credit by February 1st. Um, with regard to our objectives today, um, as I'll re reiterate in a moment, we're going to focus on trying to identify the most common cognitive problems among persons with TBI the evidence for their management, and to outline an evidence-informed approach to the management of those problems. Um, I have, importantly, since we'll be talking about meds, no financial relationships to disclose. I do no work for drug companies. I do no medical legal work. Um, I have federal grants that I'm a part of, although those have recently ended. So as I give you this talk, I hope what I am giving you is a talk from the perspective of someone who's been involved in the field and is now a synthesizer and integrator of the information that's available, both as regards pharmacologic treatments and perhaps more importantly, non-pharmacologic treatments. Similarly, our colleagues at Craig who have planned this have no relationships to disclose either. Okay, so to slides that look more like mine. Um, as I said, we'll be talking about this. I think since the this topic, since the last time we met, um, I have now joined the faculty of the University of New Mexico. So if you see that up in the right corner, that's where that's coming from. And in that context, helping to create a bridge to the Marcus Institute for Brain Health, where I continue to serve as the director of research. Um, as I said, our task here today really is to talk about cognitive problems. And what do we mean by that? Why do we see them? What kinds of problems do we see? How best to think about assessing them? And then to look at the evidence that would inform truly an, a, a, a meaningful and systematic approach to the evaluation and management of persons with post-traumatic cognitive problems. As we did last time in November, let me just make sure we're all on the same page as we start this talk, that when we're talking about traumatic brain injury, we're using the federal definition that's now coming on 30 years old with an application of external physical forces to the brain, whether that is direct trauma, acceleration, deceleration, blast, or often combinations thereof, that produces an immediately apparent physiologic disruption of brain function and or structure. And as we'll see in a moment, most often evidenced at the time of injury by an alteration in mental state, and that has an immediate functional consequence that as a result of those problems, even if they are transient and related to the event to the period alone, does compromise the person's ability to meet the demands of everyday life. As before, what we're not talking are all the things on this list, 
which while certainly traumatic in a colloquial sense, as well as in a biological sense, they don't meet the criteria for biomechanical force application that is critical to the definition of TBI. As we talked about last time, and as we'll revisit a couple times during the course of this talk, that federal definition has been translated into case definitions by a number of groups, perhaps most famously the American Congress of Rehab Medicine in 1993, Kay et al. and Journal of Head Trauma Rehabilitation, who use again the same anchor from the federal definition about physiologic disruption of brain function due to biomechanical force application that produces any period of lost consciousness, loss of memory for events immediately before, more often immediately after the accident, sometimes a little of both, or other unequivocal alterations in mental state that dazed, disoriented, and confused. That definition has been incorporated, adopted, expanded by many over the years, the CDC, the Department of Veterans Affairs, Department of Defense, the International and Interagency Initiative towards Common Data Elements for Research in TBI and Psychological Health, more recently the World Health Organization, and for those who are mental health practitioners, as we'll see the American Psychiatric Association in DSM-5. Um, critical to all of these definitions, variations on the theme though they may be, is that impairment in cognition, again, loss of consciousness or memory disturbance or other unequivocal alterations in mental state, and here really the cognitive aspects of mental state are core elements of the definition, whether any other focal deficits may also be seen. Also, as we talked about last time, although we're gonna talk about cognition today and really focus our efforts there, it will, as you'll see, not only on this slide, but on subsequent ones, be critically important to recall that it, cognitive impairments usually don't happen in a vacuum. Um, they are interactive with other disturbances, especially disturbances of emotion and behavior um, of the sorts that we discussed in our prior lecture, um, as well as any number of sensory motor disturbances from fatigue, headache, pain, neuroendocrine dysfunction, visual disturbance, vertiginous problems, and so forth, all of which when present may produce sufficient load on the individual with them that they compromise the ability to fully and effectively use cognitive resources that indeed may be available. As we talked about last time, we'll also see that pre-injury factors are critical to conferring vulnerability to the effects of injury on cognition and these other systems, as well as potentially providing some resilience to those adverse effects. And so too are the imposition of post-injury factors, both for better or for worse, as they collectively lead to this constellation of problems after TBI, and especially those that we'll be talking about in the cognitive category today. Last time we talked a bit about injury factors, since if we're gonna talk about cognition after TBI, it seems important to revisit this. Um, I put here the slide that you saw last time, thinking about the major injury factors, inertial forces of the translational or coup, contra coup problems that, some, that are often part of the injury, the rotational problems, as well as the combination that produces angular acceleration with its effects, irrespective of the point of injury or the degree of rotation, most often in frontal and temporal areas, as well as at the center of mass between the compartment up above, what we call the supratentorial compartment, including the brain, basal ganglia, thalamus, and the infratentorial compartment, the brain stem, and the cerebellum, at the midpoint between which are all those systems that help keep the lights on. No surprise, as forces are applied here and the brain torques around that midpoint, that the lights should be turned off or at least turned down, as well as their, the ability of those systems to support cognition above compromised. Contusional injury, particularly in these areas you see highlighted in red as a result of abutting against these inner surfaces of the skull often adds to cognitive burden, but is not by itself the primary cause. And of course, complicating things, as we described last time, is this cascade of cellular processes that gets started when any of these biomechanical forces affect brain. In most of these kinds of diagrams, when we talk about neurochemistry, and that will be relevant given the medications we'll talk about later, the focus is often on glutamate. Uh, 
but it's important to note that it's not just glutamate that is in excess or released at the time of injury. Indeed, if we look at the anatomy of injury, same basic perspective and apply those same force vectors, we see that of course, glutamate will be affected because it's ubiquitous. Damaging cells anywhere will cause them to fire and release glutamate, but too, so too with GABA. And really importantly, that center of mass business that I talked about between the supra and infra or above and below compartments inside the skull focuses right on the, the nuclei that supply dopamine, that supply cerebral norepinephrine, that help supply cerebral serotonin and the multiple nuclei that provide the brain with acetylcholine. All critical neurotransmitters when it comes to cognition, especially for memory, for attention and processing speed, for emotional regulation and combinations thereof. The cascade that's incited that releases all of these neurotransmitters tracks reasonably well with the course of recovery after TBI. After mild TBI, that peak of neurotransmitter excess is greatest in the first 24 hours and tends to wane over the following seven days. After moderate to severe TBI, it's greatest certainly in the first 24 to 72 hours and may stay elevated as long as two to three weeks. Why does this matter? Well, in the midst of that neurotransmitter storm, introducing agents that either augment or frankly, that in isolation tend to block or antagonize one or more of these neurotransmitters tends to disrupt that cascade and often is not helpful. An example, um, Rossafont and colleagues um, divine, designed the COBRIT study using citicoline um, with the idea that as a neuro neurotropic agent, one that may actually have neuroplastic and restorative properties, perhaps its use early on would actually modify this course and facilitate recovery. Uh, one of the additional properties of citicoline is that it augments norepi, dopamine, and acetylcholine. And indeed, its use early on did not appear to improve things. And while it didn't necessarily harm it, certainly it was done in the midst of a cascade where those neurotransmitters were in excess in the front end, and accordingly not all that helpful. Similarly, in, in attempting to intervene in this early window with other agents that augment dopamine like methylphenidate or bromocryptine, acetylcholine like denepazil or rivastigmine, or that modify the glutamate component, medicines like amantadine with secondary benefits on dopamine, usually are best reserved until we're a few weeks out and all of this storm has settled down enough that the system is in whatever state it's likely to be moving forward. And indeed that state from the best available evidence uh, does appear to involve persistent damage in and dysfunction of areas with dense glutamate and acetylcholine inputs, especially the hippocampi serving memory, the frontal lobes serving complex attention, executive function. That damage being not just to the projections that support those systems, but the nuclei themselves and the brainstem for the anatomic reasons that just went over, as well as possible, although less robustly supported primary or secondary dysfunction in serotonergic, dopaminergic, nor norepinephrine, norepinephrine dependent systems and the functions they support. Combination of the structural and neurochemical injuries produces this pattern that we talked about last time with damage, especially to in red, the gray matter in frontal, especially dorsal and anterior frontal areas, ventral frontal areas right above the eyes, anterior temporal areas, and importantly, the inferior posterior cerebellum, which actually links to these areas and helps with cognition. Similarly, in those brainstem nuclei areas, especially those from this study specifically looking at cholinergic innervation in the mid portion of the me, the middle portion of the brain at the brain stem, the thalamus, and medial frontal lobes, and the white matter connections between all these areas. This from a seminal article from Krauss et al. in blue showing, or purple blue showing moderate to severe injury, in the yellow green mild injury, certainly greater with moderate to severe injury, but in some areas, the sagittal stratum, the 
uh, corticospinal tract, the superior longitudinal fasciculus, which connects frontal lobes to posterior areas, some disturbances in white matter connections across the injury severity spectrum. Why does it matter? Well, if we think about what these areas of brain do, especially in relation to cognition, the pattern of cognitive problems that we see after TBI is really entirely predictable. With ventral brain stem turning off the lights when damaged, the system supporting arousal, wakefulness and awareness being critically anchored to the upper portion of brainstem. Memory from damage, especially to the hippocampus seen here in cross section in purple, but tucked in to the medial aspect of the temporal lobe. To the amygdala as well, which helps with emotional learning and conditioning in addition to its more commonly thought of fight or flight emotional generation. The anterior temporal lobes, which with the uncinate fasciculus, a white matter fiber that goes from frontal through temporal areas and back helps with memory retrieval, as well as in the anterior portions of the temporal lobe, the semantic aspects of language, meaning what do words actually mean? And understanding that and incorporating that meaning into uh, social communication. Social cognition from damage to the orbital frontal cortex, executive disturbances from dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, including executive control of attention, memory retrieval, as well as the more intrinsic executive functions of abstraction, judgment, insight, problem solving. In the medial temporal lobe, sustained attention as well as motivation, and here showing really denuded white matter after a severe TBI versus what you see here, white matter serving processing speed. Arousal, attention, processing speed, memory, executive function, these being the sine qua non of TBI and its case definition, disturbances at the time of injury, as well as the most common problems that we tend to see after TBI. The kind of brain that's injured does matter though. Um, certainly cognitive reserve, whether cognitive reserve compromised by age, you know, the stones were right, what a drag it is, growing old for those of us in this category over 50, the effects of injury on our systems tend to be greater than they do on our 20 year old compatriots. Baseline intellectual functioning, if you have less to give away when you start, the effect of any injury may be relatively greater. And certainly prior insults further compromising that reserve. These are critical things for us to be thinking about when trying to understand why a particular person in front of us has cognitive impairments after TBI, including as we'll see after mild TBI. Emerging is a really important aspect of the brain that is injured is neurogenetics. The ApoE4 being this is an Alzheimer's associated gene. We tend to think of it as a risk factor for Alzheimer's. In fact, it's a risk factor for problems with neuroplastic repair in neurologic, neurologic diseases in general, including in TBI. Tends not to be terribly relevant in the mild TBI end of the spectrum, although there may be individuals for whom it is, more so after severe TBI, as well as other genes that modify dopamine and norepi function, especially COMT or catecholamethotransferase, the DRD2 gene, ANC1, TAC1A, another catecholamine modifying gene. These genes, when present in the wrong forms, may take a modest disturbance in dopamine and norepi systems and turn it into one that's functionally significant. And indeed, it may be the neurogenetics of catecholamine systems that explains why despite the absence of a lot of evidence of this primary injury to those systems, nonetheless, people tend to have problems associated with the systems that require dopamine and norepi and actually do benefit in many cases from treatment with medicines that improve their amounts. We also talked last time about a host of post-injury factors, some of which I'll continue to hit, but most important for our purposes today, the things that happen that are medical complications, both uncaused and caused or iatrogenic and absence of adequate intervention and treatment, including education about what to expect after TBI. These are all very important factors in understanding cognitive outcomes and improving them. As I mentioned, we're also gonna talk as we go through this over and over again about especially the importance of emotional and behavioral disturbances on cognition and the need to really think carefully about them 
before diving full on into the treatment of what appear to be cognitive problems after TBI. Two point. When we, understand, when we look at cognitive outcomes following TBI, um, there's a lot of noise in our literature with more or less adequate control for the kinds of co-occurring problems and mood, behavior, and effort, and other vo test validity, as well as the person that's injured and the severity of the injury in question. Recognizing this, the Institute of Medicine uh, commissioned a group led by Soraya Dickman in Seattle, John Corrigan, Ohio State, Harvey Levin in Houston and others to survey the literature, perform a systematic review of published peer reviewed results and from that try to identify what really to expect in relation to chronic outcomes cognitively after TBI. I think perhaps one of the most telling pieces of this is from 430 articles 11 primary and 22 secondary studies were actually methodologically rigorous enough to make the cut for informing this work. Again, suggests we really a need, some of which has been addressed in the decades since this came out, to much more carefully consider that rainbow slide, the many factors that affect brain injury outcomes beyond simple testing alone. And from that report, a few things emerge. First, that unequivocally after severe TBI, there is sufficient evidence to note that chronic cognitive problems are not unexpected, may be functionally disabling and are important potential targets of treatment, especially attention, processing speed, episodic memory, so the memory for who, what, when, where, rather than procedural memory, which is memory for how, and executive function. Less common, but nonetheless present, disturbances with language, praxis, and visual-spatial function, if Kim Fry's on the call listening, she's at Craig, she has focused her career in the last 10 years specifically on the issue of language disturbances. And indeed it may be more common than the evidence suggested back in 2009, but this is where we are for today with the evidence that we have in hand. They also concluded that after moderate TB TBI, although less well studied as a specific subgroup, there is nonetheless limited, but nonetheless suggestive evidence of processing speed, episodic memory and executive dysfunction problems in the late phase, more than six months after TBI. Importantly, and at the time with quite a uproar that surrounded it, they were unable to identify from the civilian literature that a single uncomplicated, i.e. neuroimaging normal mild TBI had lasting effects on cognition when looked at at the group level. Part of that issue is that since mild TBI in general is a relatively good prognosis event for most people, groups of persons without injuries or other comparison groups and those with injuries tend to meet with regression back to looking like the main group, given that most in the mild TBI group indeed recover. That said, they were very careful to say that while they couldn't conclude at the group level that there's evidence of chronic cognitive problems after mild TBI, we should not misunderstand that to mean there are no individual cases with injury-related cognitive losses in the group. That said, they did also reiterate a point, which I'm going to show a number of other groups emphasis on, that this is a complicated issue and that indeed there are a variety of factors that can mimic or mask cognitive effects, especially after mild TBI and failure to account for the broad differential diagnosis for those problems may lead in research to inconsistent results and in clinical practice to misdiagnosis and therapeutic misadventure. Not getting the right target in line to actually help somebody get better. The World Health Organization, Organization in 2004, through their World Health Organization Collaborating Center Task Force on Mild TBI, had its work updated in 2014 in a wonderful bundle of articles published in the Archives of Physical Medicine and Rehab. Their work looking at outcomes after mild TBI echoed what the Institute of Medicine group had found, which is that most people do recover after mild TBI, but there is a, sig a significant minority that continue to have subjective complaints. Importantly though, those complaints are concurrently associated in many cases with depression, PTSD, negative injury perceptions, poor expectation rec for recovery, and a number of other health and psychosocial factors that tend to more strongly predict outcomes 
then do the traditional biomechanical factors vis-a-vis -vis initial injury severity alone. And a more thoughtful, comprehensive view, as, a, as in the rainbow slide, is required to really think through it carefully. In the Ontario Neurotrauma Foundation, mild TBI concussion guidelines, especially those for the management of persistent symptoms in adults, as well as in the VA DOD clinical practice guidelines for the same, these two themes are reiterated. In the VA guideline, noting again that there is a minority of people with mild TBI who do go on to have continued problems with cognition, sometimes new, persistent, or worsening complaints, but that when present, they are often comorbid with other conditions that may be at least contributing, if not in some cases explanatory, and a really thoughtful review of those issues is needed before directing treatment specifically to cognition. Similarly, the Ontario group concluded the same and emphasized, again, the importance of pre-injury, injury, and post-injury factor considerations and the necessity to carefully pursue differential diagnosis, especially when thinking about cognitive outcomes. For those who practice in the mental health arena, if you read carefully the DSM-5 neurocognitive disorder criteria in relation to TBI, the same point is made, albeit much more briefly given the way the DSM-5 is written. Here emphasizing in particular the importance of depressive symptoms on cognition, you know, potential to amplify and or worsen it, as well as associated functional outcomes, and really just enjoining the reader, the clinician working within these criteria to think carefully through that issue, again, before landing on a mild or major neurocognitive disorder diagnosis. Now, with regard to that diagnosis, it turns out these criteria are actually quite helpful. Um, importantly, and as a major advance over DSM-4-TR, the, the criteria here really anchor to those common case definitions of TBI that we noted before. And in particular, the ACRM 1993 definition of TBI and particularly mild TBI. They couple it to what was then by 2009, the VA DOD severity classification system, incorporating those clinical phenomena, putting time anchors on them in relation to duration of loss of consciousness, duration of post-traumatic amnesia, if performed, the Glasgow Coma Scale score at about 30 minutes post-injury and allowing a really nice characterization retrospectively of the initial injury severity. Why? Because the initial injury severity does help us think about what to expect vis-a-vis -vis the Institute of Medicine and subsequent reviews of cognitive outcomes after TBI. They also offer a general set of criteria for mild or major neurocognitive disorder, which must be met. And importantly, in these criteria, as in most others, that the problems that will define that neuro neurocognitive disorder were present immediately after the occurrence of the TBI. We can debate what late decline looks like and its potential causes, which are many, but not necessarily only TBI, maybe the intersection with other neurodegenerative processes. But for the purposes of calling this problem neurocognitive disorder due to TBI, the difficulties in whatever domain, but especially complex attention, memory, uh, processing speed, executive function need to be there from the point of injury forward. They may in the early injury period be swamped by disturbances in basic aspects of attention and awareness vis-a-vis -vis delirium. But when that dust settles, these problems then remain and help define the neurocognitive disorder after TBI. Really importantly, if we look carefully at what those criteria are, they echo what I think the brain injury neuropsychology community has been telling us for a long time, which is that one really does need to think through these cognitive domains with a bit of a finer grained approach than many people use in everyday clinical practice. A broad range of cognitive domains typically through a brief battery of tests that assess them is really required to capture often, especially the subtle problems with higher level cognition that TBI may produce. While the use of tests like the mini mental state exam 
or the Montreal Cognitive System are reasonable to include, they cannot be the sole elements of such a battery. These tests are unidimensional cognitive measures. And while they both include lists or breakdowns of what appear to be separate domains of cognition, indeed, in most studies, especially for the MOCA, they don't actually track as specific, identifiable, separate, valid domains. They can be triggers to pick a test that does assess that domain and to go forward with it, but by themselves really are screening measures to help flag for a more domain-specific assessment. And the DSM-5 actually addresses this and identifies six domains of cognition that should be on the radar of the practicing clinician to assess in persons who are suspected of having a neurocognitive disorder of any kind, but including traumatic brain injury. Complex attention, the sustained, divided, or better alternating attention, higher level selective attention, processing speed being one, learning and memory being another, language being a third, perceptual motor is the category under which they've subsumed a number of things, but certainly all of these executive function, and importantly, social cognition. If you go to the pages I've referenced here, for those of you who have a DSM-5, 593 to 595, you'll, you'll see these tables. They actually provide not only the domain descriptions of the kinds of troubles that may actually be seen in persons with mild or major neurocognitive disorders, but they go on further to describe, unfortunately not by name, but at least by type, the kinds of tests that may actually be useful to deploy when attempting to assess cognition after TBI. With regard to how much of a cognitive impairment is needed to qualify for these disorders, the DSM also offers diagnostic criteria for mild and for major neurocognitive disorder. In mild neurocognitive disorder, the language in the text box, not all that helpful, is modest cognitive decline in at least one or more cognitive domains, of the big six that I just went over. And they note that to stay in the mild category, while present, it's important that those deficits don't preclude independence in every day activities. They may make those activities much harder, especially complex, higher level activities of daily living, like paying bills, managing medications, scheduling, et cetera but require greater effort, compensatory strategies, or accommodation. With those efforts, strategies, or accommodations, whoever the person is able to remain independent with this level of neurocognitive disorder. By contrast, major neurocognitive disorder entails a significant cognitive decline in one or more of those domains and does actually compromise independence in everyday activities, at least at the higher level complex instrumental activities of daily living, if not more basic things. What do we mean by modest and significant? Well, again, if one looks at the text, one sees that for major NCD, what they mean by significant is performance that's typically two or more standard deviations below appropriate norms. For mild NCD, somewhere in the one to two standard deviation range below those norms. They make what, if you read it carefully, seems like a bit of a tongue-in-cheek comment, which is that you know one has to, of course, think about impairments in relation to somebody's prior performance. Optimally, this information would be available from a prior administration of the same test. Uh, people are uh, sadly not so kind as to get mini mentals or mochas or other testing on a regular enough basis for us to use that as a frame of reference. So, so we typically then need to rely on appropriate norms for the test that's actually employed and contextualize them with the individual's history, occupation, and other factors. Where were they really relative to the norm to begin with? Where are they now? And how big a delta is that? Is it one to two standard deviations vis-a-vis -a, -vis a mild neurocognitive disorder or something more than that? And <clears throat> again, put more in a simple narrative, these are the frames of reference that we'd use. Now, with regard to norms, it really is important to note that raw cutoff scores, the oft used 26 on the MOCA or 27 on the MMSC aren't adequate. These tests are highly affected by both age and education. There are indeed true normative databases available for both of them for the uh, MOCA, 
the Dallas Heart Study, Rosetti et al. 2012 actually has a great 2,700 person deep normative database for the MOCA. Highly encourage people to take a look at it. For the Mini Mental, the Crum et al. database from 1993 and JAMA with some 18,000 plus people across the age range and educational levels really do serve to allow us to make that kind of normative interpretation of the screening tests. And then of course, most of the domain specific measures we would use do have their own normative data tables to help interpret performance. What the, that interpretation does is help put people in one of these two categories along with the level of functional problems that they have to help establish when there is a neurocognitive disorder diagnosis of what type it is best described. I will just say, finally, the, when the DSM-5 came out, the idea that a, standard, a single standard deviation below performance expectations should constitute a neurocognitive disorder was not well accepted by many people. I would include myself among them, as that level of performance while below average is not really at the threshold for clinical impairment, borderline being at about the 10th percentile and more significant impairment below the seventh and certainly below the third percentile. Looking at this, um, David Notman and a whole crew of people looked at the Framingham Heart Study and Mayo Clinic Study of Aging in relation to mild cognitive impairment the antecedent to our mild neurocognitive disorder in the DSM with a brief battery and in each a screening measure to ask, well, really, where is the cut point for confidence in the, the presence of such a diagnosis? And it's at about 1.5 standard deviations below the mean. So as you go into clinical practice, I'd encourage you to be thinking about this as your threshold to have confidence in making a mild neurocognitive disorder diagnosis performances between the minus one and minus 1.5, flagging something that needs to be followed, but perhaps not yet rising to the threshold of something requiring intervention. With regard to those interventions then, let's take a look at what we might actually do. So first line is really addressing other things. As I've mentioned, and as most of the guidelines and other uh, systematic reviews have opined, when we're doing treatment of cognitive impairment, we must be first certain that indeed that's the problem of greatest interest. It may be the problem of greatest complaint, but for all kinds of reasons in the psychology of adaptation to injury, that may be a more palatable complaint for some than is depression or PTSD or anxiety disorders, or not easy to see the relationship between sleep, headache, vestibular disorders, and cognitive problems, cognitive complaints. Similarly, addressing alcohol and other substances of abuse, as, as well as the psychology in all of its aspects that may be contributing to, or in some cases explanatory of, an apparent cognitive impairment is really a critical first step. Second, while well-intended um, prescribers do have an, an occasion or two, not necessarily make things better, but sometimes to make them worse. Um, it is not uncommon, it, particularly in general hospital settings where someone with a post-traumatic confusional state or delirium is present for that person to receive what is the usual care for delirium vis-a-vis -vis low dose Haldol occasionally Risperdal or another drug with potent affinity for the dopamine type 2 receptor. Um, they are cognitively impairing and interestingly they do tend to prolong recovery from the early period of severe cognitive impairment, delirium after TBI. They don't necessarily negatively affect long-term outcomes but it may take people longer to get to those outcomes. Accordingly, taking them off the table unless they are absolutely necessary for other reasons vis-a-vis -a, -vis a schizophrenia spectrum disorder is something we really need to consider. Similarly, benzodiazepines, they reliably impair memory as well as gait. They are things that in the TBI literature, we strongly encourage people to avoid, um, to eliminate wherever possible, or if not, if not possible, to at least minimize the dose so as to reduce the likelihood that it is driving the cognitive impairments for which other treatments might then be provided. 
Similarly, anticholinergic medications from the frank anticholinergics that are sometimes used for vestibular disturbances, as well as medicines that may be used for another purpose that have strong anticholinergic effects, whether for sleep or tricyclic antidepressants for depression, for pain, including paroxetine, the anticholinergic properties of which are not as well acknowledged as perhaps those of the tricyclic antidepressants, but which are about comparable to that which we see with nortriptyline, for example. While anticonvulsants are sometimes necessary, these three that you see here are well known to produce cognitive impairments in general, as well as in persons with TBI, where possible using alternatives to them is encouraged. Um, and other drugs like the alpha-2 presynaptic autoreceptor agonist, clonidine, and high-dose opiates are best removed from the picture whenever possible. Staying in the first line interventions, when all that's done, the next thing out of the gate should be cognitive rehabilitation in one form or another. Um, for those who aren't, aren't aware of it, the American Congress of Rehab Medicine has put together a really robust evidence-based uh, manual and training program for cognitive rehab. Certainly something I'd encourage people who are interested in doing themselves to look into. Um, the VA guidelines offer similar encouragement but they do actually make um, a comment specifically about COG rehab for mild TBI, making the case that in general, it's best to let the dust settle before going down this road explicitly. Certainly environmental and compensatory and effort and accommodation strategies are reasonable to provide in that early period after mild TBI. But when people fail to resolve and are developing more chronic, functionally limiting problems, a short trial of cognitive rehab may actually be useful, even if given concurrently to other interventions. Importantly, however, they make the point that a prolonged course of therapy in the absence of patient improvement is not encouraged, indeed strongly discouraged in their, in their guidelines. I think that's actually worth our attending to. While maintenance activities can be quite useful, chronic undifferentiated cognitive rehabilitation uh, may not be the, the best and most adaptive way to get people back into the world and functioning. With regard to the cognitive rehabs that we can apply, this is the most recent of these evidence-based systematic reviews to which that manual is anchored. Um, I won't go through the review in detail, but I do want to point out a few things that over the last 20 years, the evidence base to derive practice standards, the highest level, practice guidelines, the level below that, and practice options has developed tremendously, especially for the late and chronic problems after TBI, whether those be attention and uh, directed interventions for them, memory deficits, and a variety of compensatory as well as potentially strategy training uh, activities that may be useful here. Executive function deficits, really emphasizing metacognitive strategy training. How do I think about things, not just what I'm thinking about, as well as explicit performance feedbacks and at the option level, group-based interventions, um, as well as uh, other occupation-based treatments that can be quite helpful. Social communication, another area for which there's been uh, very good evidence, including from Lenny and her, her colleagues at Craig, um, as well as for more comprehensive holistic neuropsychological rehabilitation, an approach that if you're not familiar with it, really is analogous in its conceptual framework to that rainbow slide that I showed before, where we really try to think about the whole person, the emotion, the behavior, the physical components of the rehabilitation, and Inter intercalate the cognitive rehab into treatments for all of those things concurrently. Training how people how to manage and how to respond and recover rather than just giving them a specific task to do and under stress. With regard to pharmacotherapies, um, I would say, despite being somebody who studied this for a long time, um, they really belong in the adjunctive category. They're not always necessary. Although for docs like me, it's reflexive to throw a medication at them, I would say we really should do all the other stuff that I've just gone through first and use a medicine if it's clear that it will be necessary for those things to work. And if it's not, then to wait, see how much gain is being given by everything else and offer a medicine to help augment or complement those other interventions rather than being the primary and first hoped for magic bullet to fix the problem. 
Importantly, there are some principles to attend to that every intervention is an N of one empiric trial, even while there is a lot of evidence, which we'll talk about in a second, to help inform our treatment selection, every person's gonna be different and understanding their injury, their problems, and the pre-injury factors that may be contributing will be critical as one develops a plan for an individual patient. Simpler medicines with less complex dosing, titration, and adverse effect uh, considerations is preferred. And perhaps the most, thing, most important thing on this slide, in brain injury medicine, the adage is often used as in geriatric medicine to start low and go slow. I would tell you that is only two thirds of the statement that needs to be made, which is start low, go slow, but go. And it is often the case that people with TBI require standard therapeutic doses of medicines to have a therapeutic benefit. It just may take longer to get there and be a little more tedious to manage treatment tolerance getting there. More often than not, when I'm asked to consult on somebody who hasn't responded to treatment, it's been the case that that treatment has not been fully delivered and I'm actually uncertain of their ability to benefit from it or not. Let's move on. It's also important to consider how far out is the person from injury? Is spontaneous recovery still in play? And if so, and we're gonna pharmacologically augment it, what are we hoping for? And more importantly, when will we stop and see if indeed we've made the progress that needed to be made, stopping medicines being just as important as starting them. If somebody is still in the process of active recovery, deciding where they're at, are they in a disorder of consciousness? If so, then arousal and awareness are probably our primary targets, not higher level cognition. If they're in a post-traumatic confusional state, Getting the attentional components settled down may be the right target rather than helping to give them a memory book when they're in the midst of a confusional state. Similarly, if they're amnestic, they may not be able to benefit from executive strategies until this has resolved. So really being clear about what stage are they in and then what is my target within that stage for how long and in what way. And to the extent that we can, integrating the best available evidence with case-specific hypotheses about the cognitive targets of interest and how we're gonna go about treating them. With regard to those treatments, there's reasonable evidence for three general approaches to pharmacotherapy for cognitive impairments after TBI, especially in the subacute, meaning at least a couple of months or chronic period, six months or more after TBI. Medicines that increase catecholamines, meaning dopamine and norepi, medicines that increase acetylcholine, or both. There's a more limited literature of consisting of predominantly uncontrolled studies that look at other approaches. We'll look at a few of these, as well as some controlled studies in other areas to help inform your evidence-based approach to pharmacotherapy. So as far back as 2006, there was sufficient evidence for the Defense of Veterans Brain Injury Center and their Neurobehavioral Guidelines Working Group to actually offer uh, guidelines on the care of people with cognitive impairments after TBI. They opined that based on the available evidence, um, including a number of class one studies, that methylphenidate was probably a good treatment for attention, may be a good treatment for processing speed, both at the guideline, not standard, but guideline level, and an option for the treatment of memory impairments, although an equivocal option with, and made. I would just tell you that the dosing here is really important for the 70 kilogram person, as we often speak about in medicine, so somebody in the 150 to 160 pound range, the typical dose that one is going to get to is in the range of 20 milligrams BID. Less than that will not actually be giving them the therapeutic trial that's anchored to the evidence. So important to try to get people to that dose before opining on the effectiveness or not of this medication for them. In the years since that Warden et al. effort, there have been a number of double-blind placebo-controlled trials, 10 in this study that uh, Huang et al. published in 2016. I'm the current lead author on a practice guideline that'll be coming out of the American Congress of Rehab Medicine, looking at methyl methylphenidate for a, a variety of problems after TBI. And in that study, we found 11. So one more than this group, but the conclusions are very much the same that it does appear to be useful for helping with sustained attention, more so than selective attention, but a little bit of both. 
um, does not appear to be particularly helpful for process, processing speed with additional data since the Worden era suggesting that you know, there may be individuals who have this benefit, but as a class effect, we don't really see it in persons with TBI. Cholinergic augmentation. So what are we talking about here? We're talking about donepezil, rivastigmine, galantamine. These are our three medicines that help increase the amount of acetylcholine in the brain. As I mentioned earlier, acetylcholine being especially important for memory, for executive function, potentially also for arousal, although not well studied for that purpose in, in TBI. And at the time of the warden group, work, they recommended denepazil at the guideline level for attention and memory. Subsequent studies, including one that John Silver and I published in 2006 in neurology, a follow-up in 2009, other studies from Ali Tenavuo in Finland and Kim et al. in Korea would suggest yeah, probably guideline level for memory impairment, but at best option level for attention. And as you see, then a theme emerges with methylphenidate probably being better for attentional impairments and the cholinesterase inhibitors being better for memory impairment. We did a systematic review analogous to what Huang did in the lead up for a study I'll tell you about in a moment, but suffice it to say by the time that we did this in, and published it in 2014, there were 24 peer reviewed reports describing this class of medicines, including the very old drug physostigmine for cognitive impairments after TBI, of which five were able to meet our inclusion criteria from a, a methodologic rigor standpoint. And the driver of this was really the Silver et al. rivastigmine study. A pretty big effect size here, uh, but realistically probably something more like about a half standard deviation improvement um, when this drug is used, especially for the treatment of memory problems in the late phase after TBI. So that study that we did was funded by the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living and Rehab Research, or NIDLR. Uh, it was a multi-center RCT, including Tier, Spalding in Boston, Moss in Philadelphia, uh, Rehab Hospital of Indiana, and had Craig Hospital and their research department as our data coordinating center. It was a study of people with predominantly very severe TBI and fairly severe memory problems, but in whom we very assiduously excluded all of those other things on that list of first things to get rid of, including comorbid psychiatric conditions, as well as uh, potentially confounding medications. Where there were neuropsychiatric symptoms or problems, they were not significant enough to present a confound on the assessment of cognition, the validity, and the potential responsiveness of cognition to treatment. And indeed, this was a positive clinical trial one that we're in the midst of writing up the results on for publication currently, but as a preview of that, effect size is pretty similar to what we saw in the silver study with another drug in this category, memory being the primary thing that improved, new learning, and among those where we actually had, a, had set at least a half standard deviation improvement, about 42% response to, uh, to the drug, where only 18% of placebo uh, treated individuals responded. It's a pretty big difference in a group with very severe impairments after severe TBI. So even in that context, giving us hope that we can actually have some effective intervention here. And I would say importantly in the responder analysis, when people showed a memory improvement, they often brought uh, processing speed and to a lesser deg degree executive fun function along for the ride. This stands in contrast to the rivet study Another multi-center study that I was part of, Olga Brahman Mincer in South Carolina was the lead author um, that used rivastigmine like we did in the silver study, uh, but had it in a group of veterans in outpatient clinics who really did have pretty significant psychiatric and, and uh, related comorbidities, PTSD, depression, histories of substance use, sleep disturbance, other medications. And in this study, the intervention didn't work, I would argue, because that list of things to exclude on the front end was not adequately done, but it does actually, I think, reinforce the point uh, that we do need to address those things before going down this road in persons with TBI with a medicine. Very briefly, amantadine commonly used for the treatment of disorders of consciousness and sometimes irritability after TBI 
on its own in the late period after TBI does not appear to significantly improve cognition. So again, a good treatment to start, probably an important one to stop after people move into that post-traumatic confusional state or higher levels of consciousness. Similarly, although sertraline and antidepressants are commonly used after TBI by themselves, they do not appear to actually improve cognition. So serotonin alone doesn't seem to do the trick. There was, as I'll show you in a moment, an early study suggesting that when depression is present, its treatment with an SSRI may actually further improve things. This meta-analysis suggested otherwise, but it's important to note that not all the studies that are included in it really looked at this in the, in the way that would be needed to draw that conclusion. And in fact, the best of the studies that does look at this is from Jesse Fan and colleagues back in 2001, patients with depression treated with sertraline. And I'll just, for the point of going quickly through it, a range of cognitive improvements, especially attention, memory, and executive function, improving when depression itself was first treated. And in this group, obviating the need for further treatment of cognition specifically. Finally, we have now actually done what we think is the first study of pharmacologically augmented cognitive rehabilitation. And indeed, what we are able to show is that this adjunctive therapy, in this case with methylphenidate, improved people's ability to benefit from either one of two different versions of cognitive rehabilitation, but especially compensatory strategy training. And the group that received combined treatment did better than either medication alone or pharmacotherapy alone, or uh, cognitive rehab alone. So in summary, what I hope we've gone over, uh, a lot of information in a short time, but here I think the key points to take away are that cognitive impairments are common, persistent, potentially disabling, and importantly, treatable consequences of severe and moderate TBI. Functionally limiting cognitive impairments are uncommon chronic consequences of mild TBI, but when present, they are potentially important targets of treatment, whether indirectly through the treatment of other co-occurring conditions or when they become problems in their own right through the variety of, of ways that we've just talked about. When we see these problems, attention, processing speed, episodic memory, and executive function are the ones most often involved. Again, managing, contributing, or explanatory comorbidities, as well as reducing other medicines that may interfere with cognition are really prerequisites to cognition-specific interventions. And using the DSM-5 criteria, as well as the screening approach um, uh, complemented by domain-specific assessment is strongly encouraged. The co current evidence supports three general pharmacotherapies when we use them that can help augment um, the functioning of the brain systems needed for attention and memory. You see them here. Cog rehab really is the gold standard, but pharmacotherapy may also help improve it more than either drug alone or cog rehab alone. Moving forward, really what we need to do is to come back to some of those other points I made, especially about genetics and looking for whom are which of these treatments the right intervention. Are there people whose systems are sufficiently built that cog rehab alone is all they need? Are there others who we can pick out the right treatment for them pharmacologically to get the most out of those interventions? Ideally, we'll need the same kind of multi-center randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled studies that I've gone over today that integrate these very appro various approaches to really help improve optimal methods for pharmacologic facilitation and cog rehab after TBI. As you might imagine, this is work that's been done over a very long period of time with a whole host of collaborators and funding sources. I want to acknowledge all of them there, especially the research department at Craig and their work on the memory study with me. And with that, I will stop and take some questions. I know we're at the top of the hour if people need to leave. Um, I appreciate your hanging with us while we've done this. Um, but I'm certainly happy to take any questions from those who would like to stay for at least the next five or 10 minutes. Lenny, I'll turn it back to you. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Arsenegas. I also wanna mention that uh, the presentation today has been recorded and will be available on the series website. Um, we'll also be sending you a link to the recording as well. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question, if you can put it in the Q&A rather than the chat, and we'll wait a few minutes and see if we have some questions. <laughs>
Lenny, while we're here and people are thinking, I have a question for you, um, which is, you know, the, the social cognition, I think, has been a, an under addressed area in clinical practice, especially um, outside of brain injury medicine specialty clinics. Um, the DSM-5 in identifying it as something important for us to attend to gives fairly limited guidance on how to assess it. Can you to give us as clinicians a little thoughts from your experience with social cognition and communication of what you would have us do in clinical practice to, to get a better handle on social cognition and maybe get people into treatment? Yeah, sorry, we're having a, a stat call here. <laughs> um, in, in terms of, I couldn't hear everything that you said because of that stat call, but you were talking about assessment in terms yeah. of- So social cognition, if you have to put, if you had to put a tool or two in the hands of the average clinician trying to get a handle on their patient's social cognition after TBI, what would you have us do? Um, it's an excellent question. I think it depends on really the, the point in which the person is at in, in terms of recovery. Um, many of the people that we work with in our social competence groups are people who have completed rehabilitation and they're back out in the community. Um, and we're really looking at their, their social skills uh, functionally, um, how they interfere with their lives um, and having each person complete a self-assessment to really look at how, how our uh, social skills and social behaviors interfering with their life asking the family to do that same kind of assessment, and then asking um, a rehab professional to do that assessment as well and making comparisons of those, and then helping the person develop really functional goals based on how those difficulties are, are getting in their way in daily life. Fair enough. Um, there are a couple of uh, questions in the queue here about CE and um, Somebody wanted me to put my email back up on the screen. I did that for a minute while you were talking there, Lenny. Um, I think also uh, there's a question that I'll defer to you, Lenny, about obtaining copies of today's presentation. I think you did mention that the recording is available. Um, is that where you would direct people? Lenny? Oh. Yes. Um, the re recording will be available on the website, as are all the recordings from all of the, uh, the webinars that we've done so far. Uh, that'll be up in about a week after, the, after today. Um, and Dr. Arsenegas, if you'd be willing to, to do another PDF of your presentation as you did the last time, I think that would be really helpful for folks. And we can send that out um, through an email uh, to the attendees. I'll be happy to do it. Um, I'll just give people a heads up that, uh, as you can imagine, with the images and other figures that are in this particular presentation, it's a big file. So the slides and the tiles may have to be um, sized down and optimized as a PDF to make it transmittable by email. But we will come up with something. Um, there's also a question from Teresa Del Castillo about parenting skills uh, training for persons with TBI. So this one's a little bit outside my expertise, but Lenny, it may be in yours. Any thoughts on um, ways to approach parenting? And I maybe can make it more general caregiving skills training for persons with TBI, especially in the context of cognitive impairments. I'm wondering if this question is about uh, the person with the brain injury as a parent. And um, interesting. Okay. And if if that is, then um, sometimes that that's addressed in social skills training. I know in in the groups that uh, we do here at Craig, um, uh, Jody Newman and myself, um, our the group is called GIST Group Interactive Structured Treatment, and we address parenting um, as well as other other relationship skills. Um, I know there are some other um, couples treatments and uh, social skills treatments uh, that might also address that. I think a, a good resource is the Brain Injury Association of America website. Um, I believe it's BIAA.org. Uh, 
Good. Well, um, I appreciate everybody attending today. I hope the talk was useful and that there may be some, uh, some takeaways and skills that have come out of it. And I will look forward to joining you all for the remaining webinars uh, in this series. Uh, Happy New Year to everyone. And I uh, hope you all have a great start to your new year. Great. Thank you Bye so now. much. Take care.